Graham. Hey, David. I got a joke for you. Let's hear the joke. Why did the kid bury the walkie-talkie? I don't know. Why did the kid bury the walkie-talkie? The batteries died. Oh, oh. that's kind of sad and yeah. somber joke. Yeah, well, I mean, when you're burying something. You know what? I'm going to give you the highest rating <laughs> of season three so far. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm going to give that I'm, one. I'm on the edge of my seat. Give that one a four. A four. A four. Well, uh, you know what? I'll take it. I'll Actually, take it. I'm going to give it a three. Because, because of, you want to be able to go up? <laughs> no, because of the triple A batteries that go in the walkie-talkie. So three, a -A -A. three A's, three, three, stars. three stars for this. I mean, if you want to dig yourself into that kind of hole, <laughs> <laughs> hey, then I would then by all means. Can you do better? I've got a joke for you. Okay. What do you call an alligator... In a vest. An alligator in a vest. Oh boy, uh, a lizard sheriff? I knew you'd get it wrong. It's an in a vestigator. <laughs> in a vestigator. In a vestigator, okay. Did you, you're not, I don't, I, did you come up with that one? I might, uh, no, I did not. This joke was sent in by Julia. Julia, well, I'm gonna give. Is Julia a listener or like a friend of yours? Or is Julia like, a listener? Is Julia an actual investigator? Julia is a listener, and I'm not just saying that. So you give give me a higher score. It's not my joke. It's, it's Julia's joke. <laughs> well, Julia's joke is going to supplant. I'm just kind of come up with as many puns about burying as I can. Uh -huh. Supplant my joke for the highest rating of the season. Wow. And see, it's a low bar because I could just say 3.5, but it's you a could. better joke than 3.5. Just because you are being petty doesn't mean that I'm going to be petty. <laughs> I'm going to give that one a seven. Wow. It's a seven. I think Great it's job, a seven Julia. joke. Good job, Julia. I, I'm glad you didn't throw dirt on that one. <laughs> you know what? Enough of the nonsense. Let's get on with the nonsense. Welcome back to Withy Windle, a whimsical interactive show for kids who love stories, words, and groan-worthy jokes, featuring your favorite authors and illustrators. It's part book club, part game show, and it's your weekly adventure through the wild world of wordplay. This is season three. We're back! We did it. Look at us. What have you been doing? Look at us. Look, okay, look so, at us. <laughs> so, uh, well, my name's Graham Pittman. Uh, are you sure? Does it have, I mean, like... <laughs> Wait. Maybe you changed it during the maybe I was I was asking you what you're doing uh -huh. so that you have the option to say, well, during the break, I changed my name to Bradley Bonaparte. Bradley Bonaparte? Yeah. Old BB himself? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. It could be anything. It could be like William Wordsworth. William McGonagall. <laughs> okay, so during during this long William extended McGonagall. break, I've actually I've been very productive. You've been Rewrote a great American novel. I did not. You skied Mount Everest. Can you ski Mount Everest? You could try. Did you do that? I did not. You invented a new light bulb. Uh, no, not not at all. So what I did? Oh, is you're I, just going to tell me? Okay. I, I traveled around the state, the great state of North Carolina. Okay. On my penny farthing. Do you know what that is? <laughs> <laughs> the bicycle thing? That's one of those bicycles with the giant wheel in the front and the, <laughs> and the tiny wheel in the back. I did not realize you were a penny farthing enthusiast. Oh, a great one. But are you an expert? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> so I, tra I traveled around the great state t sampling and buying the greatest snacks imaginable. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Being a penny farthing enthusiast, could you in some detail give us... A description of what it is like to ride a penny farthing around the state of North Carolina. Sure, you get a lot of, I would say, um, excited and curious glances. <laughs> I imagine that would make sense. People point and they kind of look like they're laughing, but they're probably laughing with me, is what I like to imagine. As opposed to at you. Correct, yeah, yeah. I'm, um, yes. It's okay. very bumpy. Um, I had to wear three helmets at the same time <laughs> because that's a long way down. So do you have to get the helmet that fits your head and then another helmet that's big enough to fit your head and then also a helmet? Yes. And then do you have to do that again? Yeah, they're custom made. Okay. I spent a lot of money okay. um, trying to find the best snack that I could find and I finally yeah. found it. Okay. You did? You found yeah. the best snack? Up in uh, Ashlandboro, North Carolina. It's a small town. You've never heard of it. Ashlandboro? Ashlandboro. 
I hope that's not a real place. Uh, Ashlinboro, North Carolina, I found it. <laughs> okay. Okay, you, you've heard of a double stuffed Oreo? Yes. It's just got I, extra... I, mean, I prefer the double stuffed to the regular stuff. It's stuffed. just got extra cream in it? Right, yeah. I found... You're not going to believe this. <laughs> not a triple stuff. Okay. Not a quadruple stuff. Okay. Not a mega stuff, which is a real one. It's just one giant Oreo. Is the mega stuff five? I don't know. Green it's just stuff, huge. Top, top. This one is a hundred stuff Oreo. Oh. Okay. hundred stuff Oreo. And it comes in, in like a jar and it doesn't have cookies. <laughs> you know how it doesn't have the cookies on it? <laughs> so it's just a jar of the filling. Yeah. Do you then... I'll show it to you here. See, it's for just right here. Well, it is. That is a significant. That is a yeah. significant thing. Oh, but but hold on. So like, do you have to buy the cookies separately and then you spoon it out? No, I've just it... been eating this out of the jar. That does explain why it's three quarters of the way empty. Yeah. Well, is this snack time? How are we doing snack time now? And you might say this is just a jar of frosting. <laughs> well, I mean, it does say on it jar of frosting. But I like to think of it as a hundred stuff Oreo in the best snack in North Carolina that I found in Ashlandboro. Is that what or where it was? <laughs> yeah, that's okay, what yeah. you said. Ash, Ashland, Borough. Ashland Borough. Ville. Well, okay, so we're now, we're now on the, like snack time. This is a very important segment here on Withy Wendell. Yep. Let, just let me finish off this. Uh... Well, no, no, don't finish it off because my snack oh. that I brought is you can hear it crinkling here. It is it's Girl Scout cookies, Thin Mints. Mm. So I want to propose that we use these Thin Mint cookies. Oh. To make our own Oreos using jar of frosting from Ashlandboro, North Carolina. Yeah. 100 stuff Oreo frosting. Yeah. And yeah. make our own with the mint flavor. I love this. Okay, here. You take. Here, okay. Here's yep. some for you. Okay. Now. Here. Just let's, scoop this on Let's here. scoop it on here. All right. Sorry, there wasn't scoop. as much okay. as there was this morning. <laughs> I had this for breakfast and lunch, so. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. And we didn't say snack time starts and ends at this thing. It's just all, it's always right. snack exactly. time. Perpetual okay. snack time. Let's, you know what? Let's take a bite. We're gonna take a little break. We'll come back in a second, tell people about the episode. But we've, because it's gonna take, it's gonna honestly take us a half hour probably to eat these mega stuff. No, mega stuff's a thing. 100 stuff Oreos with, with Girl Scout cookies. So we'll be right back. Uh, and we're back. Okay, so actually, David undersold this. This is now the next day. <laughs> it took us an entire day to eat that. We camped. We camped out. We camped yeah. out. What, what is your favorite Girl Scout cookie? Well, I do really like the Thin Mints, you know, like yeah. in the freezer. I really like the Samoa ones. The oh, coconut so and the chocolate good. and the caramel or whatever that is. Do you have like a Dark Horse favorite? The lemon ones. But you know what I found mm. out? That every couple of years, they they make a new lemon cookie. What does that mean? What, what do you they, mean? Like they have a lemon flavor is something they like to do, but they don't do the same one all the time. Like it's always the same Thin Mint. Wait, so yet. you can't get nostalgic for this? I just can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> I was at the grocery store and I walked out and there were the Girl Scouts there. Right? Yeah. And like, you can't not buy cookies from the Girl Scout. Yeah. So I wanted the lemon ones and yes. I said, do they still make those lemon ones that are like, they're like about the circumference of a baseball? Like that's the, the circumference oh, big. of the word. Yeah. They're pretty big. But then on the bottom, they're iced. So it's not. Oh, it's, that sounds great. It's, and it's like when you, when they're cold. They're, that's like, that sounds like something I'd be nostalgic for if I've ever had it before. <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, I am, but and they told me that they have different lemon cookies and now because the, they rotate through. Did the Girl Scout sigh and say, oh, this again? Pretty and much. she had to explain the whole, th you know, she gets that question every five minutes. Pretty much. But, you know, I gave her 10 bucks. And so my favorite is the Thin Mint. And I would eat an entire sleeve and have before. Don't do that, though. You don't so, feel good afterwards. Are we still on snack time? I'm just curious about these girls. Yeah, uh, we're 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 in the epilogue of snack no, time. Okay, okay. We're ex we're in extended time, <laughs> extended snack time. What do they call that thing at the end of the credits? Like after the credits in a the stinger in a, in a movie? Yeah, this is the snack time stinger. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I love the thin mint. I love mint, and I know people That's, don't. I, I know. Well, I know that when we go get ice cream or milkshakes or whatever, I feel like you're always getting something mint. Mint, yeah. Mint and, Oreo, and, and whenever mint people chip. don't like mint flavor, they always say. It tastes like toothpaste, to which I reply, toothpaste is delicious tasting. <laughs> That's why they make it that flavor. Don't eat it, but it's delicious. <laughs> well, there are degrees of, of the mintiness. But anyway, we're here on the first episode of season three. Mm. This is going to be an amazing season. Agreed. We have some wonderful guests, and we actually can start saying some names, but we're only going to say this week's. We should say next week's, too, because then people okay. can email us at podcasts 
at goldberrybooks.com. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I like this idea. So this week, we are going to be talking to the great, the stupendous, the amazing Kate DiCamillo. She is the author of books like Because of Wind dixie and The Tale of Despero and others that we will talk about here in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Next week, who's our guest? Uh, next week is Tim Probert, who is the author and illustrator of... I almost say Windfall. Lightfall. <laughs> yeah, one of our favorite graphic novels. And there's a second one coming in Very April. soon. Yep, yeah. this month. And that is not an April Fool's joke. It is not. It, I, I don't know the exact date it comes out, but it's uh, I weeks, believe it's April 26th. Weeks, not months. That's right. If you've never read Lightfall, now is a great time to get your hands on that and read it this week before he comes on next week. And if you have questions for Mr. Tim, send them to us. What's that email again? Podcasts at goldberrybooks.com podcast at goldberrybooks.com. So we're going to talk to Tim Probert next week. This week, we're going to talk to Kate DiCamillo, and we'll tell you a little bit about her in a few minutes. But Graham, we also are going to be doing a book again, because this is a book podcast. And so we're going to have a book club period. And the book this season is going to be called, well, actually, it's not going to be called, it is called <laughs> The Phantom Tollbooth. And we're also going to tell you about that in a few minutes. Oh. But before we get to that, mm. we have a new segment. It's, it's a time? We, we previewed this last week. We told people, we promised people that there is going to be a new segment. Yes. Graham, you're the keeper of the new segment. I'm the you're keeper the, of the segment? I the, hope not. That's, you're the master of the new segment. It's a lot of responsibility. You are the boss of the new segment. You are the chief new segment -er. Are you ready to reveal to us, Captain O segment, sir, what the new segment is? This segment is going to be called Lazy Words. Lazy Words. All That's right. actually a little too scary. What's the, how, what's the right tone of voice to do Lazy Words? Lazy, lazy Words. Lazy Words. Wait, what does Lazy Words mean? So, I've been compiling over the years. Like, how many years? Probably like 10 years. <laughs> okay. Whenever, <laughs> okay, so the English language is funny. All mm -hmm. language is probably kind of funny. I don't know. I don't speak in any of the other ones. Um, so the English <laughs> you one. You speak Canadian. I, yeah, true. Uh, and that's very funny. Um, <laughs> so I've been compiling a list of words that I think are funny based on their overall laziness. Now, this laziness is subjective. You mean like they're not doing a lot of work? I mean that, l l let's say somebody... Names. Oh, oh, you mean like it was the wrong, like whoever named it was being lazy? That's what I mean. Okay. <laughs> okay. Or that's how I feel. Oh, okay. 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 These might not necessarily be lazy words, but I think they're funny okay. because I feel like they're lazy. But and they're I not think, that creative. Yeah. Okay. Like um, most of them are, or a lot of them are compound words, which means they put two other words together to form right. a word. Okay. Like this week's lazy word. Okay. What is it? This week's lazy word is roller coaster. Okay. 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 So why do you feel like that's a lazy word? All right. So if you take the word roller coaster. Imagine you're going on a roller coaster thinking about how yeah. roller coaster is. Oh, a and I, okay. So let me back up a second. English is kind of funny because you learn it. You learn all the words. You're, you know, you just start speaking when you're young and everything just becomes normal and you don't think about it anymore. But every True. once in a while, a word pops out at you. Maybe you've read it a bunch of times in a row or said it a bunch of times in a row. And you're like, whoa, that's kind of weird word. Actually, now that I see it a lot or think about it a lot. Like so the roller, word, the. So roller coaster was one that popped out to me because I was like, this word just describes two of the things that the roller coaster it does. It rolls and coasts. It rolls and coasts. <laughs> and, and so I feel like for, for a machine... An epic, fun machine to have. I see what you're saying. A very lazy name like roller coaster, and not uh, two descriptives that aren't even the best ones. Like it could be called <laughs> speeder twister. Yeah. That's okay. I see like, what you're saying. See, that sounds more yeah. fun. Okay, yeah. so this week's lazy word: roller coaster. So should we solve this problem for the universe and come up with a new term? That's you, you're ahead of me. That is exactly what I think lazy word should be. We should identify the word we okay. feel like is lazy okay. <laughs> and then coaster, propose okay. new words. So speed or twister, if we're going to just compound a couple. Yeah, if we're just going to take that model. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, what about uh, the whirly gagger? <laughs> what? Oh, okay. It, it, just off the top of your head there, 
immediately a better name. <laughs> immediately. I like it when, yeah, Whirly, that sounds fun. Gagger sounds dangerous. That's true. Perfect. <laughs> per- uh, we did it. What about the f- flippity floppiter? Yeah, it's a mouthful. Well, I guess so is roller coaster. Yeah, but you're flipping and you're flopping. You're just tied in. Yeah. Yeah. What about... What about the faller outer? No, that doesn't sound <laughs> that's, good. That's, that's not, not good. That's not, not great. Good. No. What about the super stellar action rider smoke on your tail maker? Okay. I like the enthusiasm. Too much? It's too much. What about boom? Just boom? Yeah. I could go for it. I think it's better. I think We're going to go to the park and we're going to ride the... Boom. And when you write it, you have to write it in all caps right. and draw like a little explosion around it. Right. Exactly. I love exactly. this. Okay. Okay. But we came up with some good ideas, but I think the kids oh, should we'll also let, send we'll us. The listeners. They have... need to, th- you guys, you, for the, for the sake of the English language, listener, think of a better name for roller coaster. Y- you are English's only hope. Well, e- each of you are part of. English's English is only, only hope. hope. Yes. You're not the you're not the only one, but you and all of the people who are listening are all the only hope. I'm confused now about the way only hope works. Okay, so, so people, how are people going to send us the again podcast? Oh, the emails, the email at goldberrybooks.com. Send us your idea <laughs> for what you think roller coaster should be renamed. We'll compile them if we get enough of them, and maybe post them on our Instagram. Or maybe we'll share a few in the next episode. Oh, that's a great idea. When we share the next lazy word. But Graham, you know what this brings us to, right? Uh, r- refresh me. The next segment. Oh. <laughs> I, I should have known. I shouldn't. It's, it always, book, it's book time. It always comes around. It's book time. I know. You finish one segment and then you got the next. <laughs> so we're going to talk to our, our guest this week. That's Katie Camillo, of course. But first, we got to talk about introduce the kids to the Phantom Tollbooth. Now, this is a book by... The, the author's name is Norton Juster. Yes. This is a book from 1961, and it's mm. a children's fantasy adventure novel. Um, and famously, the illustrations are by Jules Pfeiffer, I think is how you say it. Yeah. F-E-I-F-F-E-R. Yeah, that's now, right. You've read this book, right? A few times, but n- but probably not in 10 years. So yeah, it's I'm, been a while for me, too. I'm super excited. But, I, I, I know I love this book. Now, if I'm not mistaken, there is a... a um, human in your house who also likes this book a human yeah okay that rules out one living being (laughs) don't Uh, say who don't say who (laughs) yeah my son i don't want to guess (laughs) yes my son uh really loves this book he we uh got it from the library on you're referring to gerald right gerald your son gerald my son gerald Um, he, he doesn't like to go by that no he prefers his actual name uh, which is Rowan. So the fact that I've been calling him Gerald all these years, I'm not supposed we, to do that? We don't like conflict, so I haven't, I haven't pointed it out. Um, I see. Well, at least we, we brought it up on the air in front of everybody. <laughs> Rowan, I apologize. I will no longer call you Gerald. <laughs> at least to your face. Uh, I was going to say our nickname for him, but um, I'll save that for a later episode because <laughs> that's a funny story too. Um, but when he was probably five or six, Tinkerbell. we got it from the uh, library on CD. <laughs> This is when our CD, CD player still worked. <laughs> yeah, it was house. a real thing, yeah. And he would listen to it. He's probably listened to it a dozen times. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a really fun book. And, okay, so I think it'd be good if we just summarize the story, because there's probably a lot of kids who are like, The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Juster from the 60s. I've never heard of that book. What? Yeah, but the way you just said, The Phantom, just listen to that title. The well, Phantom Tollbooth? That, that, that must title, be a bore. Or, yeah, okay, fair. <laughs> I don't mean that when you hear the title, you are no longer going to think that you, that's something you want to read. It's just maybe a book that not a lot of kids have heard of. Okay. It's, it's, it's a classic, but and it's you, also a little older. And so you want us just to tell, uh, tell so the kids all about it and, and yeah, I spoilers? Think we should, why don't we just tell the whole story over the next hour and then... Why don't we tell the whole story over the next 10 weeks, a Maybe. couple chapters at a time? Okay, okay we'll do that then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. So this is a story that follows a bored young boy named Milo who unexpectedly receives a magic toll booth that transports him to the once prosperous but now troubled Kingdom of Wisdom. That is true. So that's that's the basic. But there's also a dog. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a quest. There's a oh, castle yeah. in the air. Mm. There's exiled princesses. Mm. 
and apparently that like there's probably like valuable lessons and things like that along the way. So, so we're gonna yeah. we're, we're gonna read this book. We're gonna talk about it. And how many chapters should we do for next week? Uh, just the first two. First two. Two chapters. Two chapters. All right. And those are chapters month <laughs> and tooth. As we have speaking of the English language being weird, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not English, so... Uh, but I do feel like by using the terms one, two, three, fourth, and stuff, we have solved a lot of problems for people who use the English language. True. Just like consistency. Podcast. Yeah, consistency, that's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so would, is there anything you want to add? Like anything that kids should be prepared for or look out for or you're excited about even in the Phantom Toll booth? I would say prepare for twists. And turns. Oh, this sounds like roller coaster talk again. <laughs> Twists and turns. A roller coaster of an experience. And a lot of fun. And a little bit of nervous excitement. This again, roller coaster. And so one of the reasons we wanted to do this book, besides all the things that you just described, is that the author, Norton Juster, he passed away in 2021, just mm -hmm. last year. And he was 91 years old and he's a great author. And we thought... What better way to honor him and to celebrate his life and his career by reading one of his books with all of you on this podcast where we celebrate kids' books. Absolutely. So, um, and did you know he was a working architect his entire life? You just did a thing with your hand. You said a working architect, and then you did a gesture. His entire and now, life. Okay, I see. His entire life. Okay. Yeah. All he kids. wasn't like an architect, published a book that got really famous, and then was like, I'm going to be an author. He was just he's like a, a pretty celebrated architect. And I think that when the kids read this book with us, there's going to be some things that when they read it, they're going to think, okay, yeah, I can see how an architect would write this book. Yeah, this guy knows how to build a book. Yeah, build exactly. a world. Exactly. Build a story. And of course, building a book, that concept is something we talk about a lot here on the podcast when we talk to the authors, which of course brings us to this week's guest, the great, the wonderful, the awesome. I don't remember what the other adjectives were that I used. Would you like to throw an adjective in here for Kate DiCamillo? Splendiferous. The, the splendiferous Kate DiCamillo. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to eat some more uh, Oreos and a uh, jar of icing. And we'll be back to introduce you to Kate DiCamillo. So just hold your horses, all right? Okay, we're back. It's time for our conversation with Kate DiCamillo. What is one thing you most enjoyed about this conversation with Katie Camillo? Because I thought we had a great time. She, uh, she was hilarious. That, oh, that's a good one. She and was. I, and I also enjoyed her quiz answers. As the master of the quiz. You're master of the segments and also the quiz. I also enjoyed the quiz questions. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm just pumping my own tires. So. That's true. That's true. Well, you know, if they're flat, you can't get far. So, Especially on a penny farthing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it was, what could you, can you ride a penny farthing if just that little wheel in the back is flat, but the big front one is still going? Like, you know, the best can you thing. Just drag that wheel along like a limp leg. The best thing about a penny farthing, and <laughs> listeners, you might not know this. <laughs> Can't wait for this. <laughs> the wheels are not made out of rubber filled with air, they're just solid brass. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't have to worry about flat, okay. about flat tires. I got it. Okay. They're just, you could run over a nail or a elephant. Yeah, yeah, you'd be fine. Exactly. Yeah. I think bra brass is kind of a soft metal, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't anyway. Know. So, Kate so Kate Camillo. Did you know that Kate DiCamillo's given name is Katrina? Katrina DiCamillo? No, I did not know that. She is a American author and she has published, guess how many novels she's published? 13. More. 14. <laughs> Graham, this is going to take forever. 29. Over 25. So maybe 29. Yeah. Over 25 novels, including books like Because of Winn-Dixie, The Tiger Rising, The Tale of Despero, The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, The Magician's Elephant, The Mercy Watson series, and Flora and Ulysses. Guess how many books she has sold? How many copies of her books have been sold? 13 million. 37 million copies of her books have been sold. Four of them have been made into films and two of them into adapted musical uh, settings. She's won a bunch of awards, including the Newbery Medal. And guess how many Newbery Medals she's won? Two. That's right. Two. I thought you were going to guess 13 again. Oh, uh, I didn't fail the quiz. She's, she's, eh, we'll see. That's just the first question. Uh. She is one of only six authors to have won two Newbery Medals, which is the big award that are, is given to authors of kids' books. She 
is a wonderful conversationalist. She's a great person to talk to about books. She had great advice for all the, for all of you who are listening. And as Graham mentioned, she is hilarious. She also has a new book out that was published last year. It's called The Beatrice Prophecy. And we talk a little bit about that as well. So if uh, you haven't read The Beatrice Prophecy, but you really like Katie Camillo's books, you absolutely should go to the library or find the audiobook, or go to your local bookstore uh, and, and get your hands on The Beatrice Prophecy and, and read that as fast as possible. It's really good. So with that, Graham, what do you say we kick it over to our conversation with Katie Camillo? Yes. On a scale of one to one, how great was this conversation? 13. Indeed. Well, KT Camilla, we are thrilled to be chatting with you. Um, you're a, you're like a, what do they call it? a bucket list interview for us here on Withy Wendell. So thank you so uh-huh. much for coming on. Although I hope that it doesn't mean that we're both about to die. <laughs> or, or me either, right? And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it hasn't even started yet and I'm already having fun. So um, <laughs> I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> well, great. Um, we have a bunch of questions here from the kids who listen to this podcast, who read your book. Um, we got a bunch of questions sent in that are uh, both generally about you, but then also about your books. Uh, but we have to go to an old standby question. We ask this question to every guest who comes on our podcast first. I think it was a, a kid named Aiden who first asked this and it went over so well, we return to it every season. So here in season three, we're bringing it back. Are you ready for the most important question that you're going to uh, experience or have have put forth on this interview? Yes, I, I feel properly serious and prepared. When you are snacking, are you a Cheetos or a Doritos fan? Oh God, that's so easy. It's it, I, I, flaming hot, crunchy Cheetos. That yeah, it's just like, and of course, it's like I mean, no one has to think about that. Do people actually say Doritos? <laughs> oh yes. Yes, I and say, I, 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 is Kate the first person to to put the qualifier flaming hot before Cheetos too? I don't know if anybody's ever guessed know. or or selected that one. I, I love I love those so much, and you know I, I have to say though, in, in defense of Doritos, that I um, this is a long time ago. It wouldn't mean anything to kids, but I was probably I was in my thirties, and I watched. Um, <laughs> It doesn't make any difference what I was watching. I ate a whole <laughs> bag of whole ranch Doritos. Uh-huh. And that was it for me. You know, well, that was the end. Yeah. And it's just yeah. like that never came back into into rotation after that. <laughs> yeah, that can, that can one sitting, you know, a big bag. Yeah. yeah. That gets part- rid of that desire. Yeah. The party size bag. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that can ha- that can happen too much of a good thing, right? You're right. So is so, it the with the flaming hot? Is it like do you feel like a little bit of punishment while you're eating? Is there I love spicy food. So I and I've never been able, and it's a question that my friends ask me all the time too. It's just like, why do you want it so hot that you that you feel dizzy? And I don't know. <laughs> I can't answer it. So what's your favorite? Like, are do you eat Indian food? Is it Thai food? Do you want you know what is it? You know, these yes, traditionally spicy yes, foods. Yes. Are you going as hot as you can? Yes. Yeah. Thai. Thai. I, I love Thai. Um, I love Indian. Uh, I love any food that somebody makes uh, for me. Um, and, <laughs> and 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 then if they can, I you know I don't cook at all. But um, uh, I grew up with uh, my my father was Italian, so with Italian hot peppers. And um, I've never cooked them, but I can I can tell somebody exactly how to do it so that I can. Uh, have them all the time. <laughs> so you mentioned that you're Italian. We do have some other food questions um, here in a second. But what is your favorite Italian dish? If you had to choose, what is it? What are you? What are you? What are you eating? Oh golly! I mean, really, I I, I hate to to be so predictable, but I I love pizza in every incarnation. So my Italian grandmother made fantastic pizza, but I Mm. also like pizza that is like turning on, um, you know, the, like the convenience store kind of like, (laughs) I I like that too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just a winner, no matter, uh, with crushed red pepper flakes on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, okay. Food, a couple more food questions that the kids have asked. Are you generally a fan of sweet food or savory food? I mean, we already know you're a fan of spicy food, but if you have to choose between sweet and savory, oh, what do you choose? Savory, totally savory. Okay. Yeah. 
Coffee or tea? <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> I would say that that's the question. That is the answer we get most of the time. Yeah, I was going to say, no, no real writer is going <laughs> to. Yeah. And then uh, cake or cookies, if you have to go sweep. I, uh, cookies. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, you know, yes, cookies. But give me a potato chip. Give me a spicy hot Cheeto. Yeah. So when you're writing, are you a snacker? Are you, are you eating not. these? Okay. No, no, I don't snack at all. I just like uh, wait until whoever it is, is going to feed me. And then I shove as much food in my mouth as I can when I'm at their house. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Before we move on to some other very serious questions and we'll uh-huh. talk about your new book, can you tell us exactly how we're supposed to properly pronounce your name? Because I'm sure there's the way that people pronounce it. And then there's the way that your father pronounced it. Uh, De Camello? Yeah. Is yeah. It just, it's just um, how it looks. Uh, it is how it looks. Um, people want to sometimes make those L's silent, yeah, but yeah. in Italian, you you say the L's. So decamello. And um, as a mnemonic device uh, or a helpful device, I sometimes say think mellow, even though I am the antithesis of mellow. I'm <laughs> one of the most erotic people you're ever going to meet. But yeah, decamello. You mean, I think you mean you're a writer, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I figured, you know, it's a, we, we could set the record straight because in our bookstore, I've had people say your name in, you know, both ways. So now it's officially on the record on the Withy Whittle podcast, how to say, say your name from the, directly from the source. Yeah, so I feel right. better now. Yeah. I feel like I can point people to And you said it right in the very beginning. I was impressed with you. <laughs> <laughs> my two semesters of Italian in college that I don't remember at all. Um, so uh, we've got lots of questions, of course. Uh, Graham's going to gonna dive into some of those. But could you just give us um, a little bit of a summary about your newest book? Um, you, I'm sure you spent years working on it. It's out in the world now. Um, it's called The Beatrice Prophecy. And you know, for the kids who maybe have read your other classics, but haven't read that one yet. What, what, what inspired that? What's the, what's the deal with that book? So you generally yeah. open it up like that. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, I always feel kind of like, um, I did a, I did a, a an interview with a librarian a, a few days ago and I, I apologize for not being able to book talk as well as, um, librarians and booksellers. It's <laughs> just like, so what is the book about? The book is about, um, a girl named Beatrice who has, uh, forgotten kind of who she is she she only remembers her name and she can read and write and it's in a time and place where it is against the law for uh, a girl or a woman to do either one of those things it's in a mm. it's in a time and place when only a handful of people can uh read and write and so this is the story of beatrice finding her way home, kind of. And uh, along the way, she becomes friends with uh, a goat named Answalica and a monk named Brother Etic and a boy named Jack Dory. So, um, and where did it come from? It's always a mystery to me. <laughs> you know, uh, this was a book that I started um, a long time ago, put in a uh, it ended up in a pile in uh, the, my, the closet in my writing uh, space and I mm. I unearthed it um, three years ago and, mm. and thought, oh, wow, okay, this is a story that I want to tell. So then I went back to it. So I've been carrying it around for a long time, part mm. of that time unwittingly. So <laughs> does that happen to you a lot where you start something uh, and then you put it aside? No, it's actually kind of like, um, it's a little bit unsettling um, that it, it did happen. There's a, there's a part in the Beatrice prophecy where Beatrice keeps on having this dream of, uh, of someone showing her a seahorse and the seahorse falling. And I would think of that uh, scene periodically and think, where did I read that? And I, in, in those, in those years in between where I forgot about it. And it's, so it's almost like writing, it was kind of like, writing something that I remembered rather than something that I was making up. I don't know. It was all kind of an mm. odd experience. Mm. Should we do some psychoanalysis? <laughs> <laughs> Should you bring in some kids and let them tell you what's up? <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty, pretty intuitive. Um, 
Graham, take it away. You got a couple questions, All right? right? Let's, like, yeah, let's slide into some of the questions uh, that we received from, from the kids. Uh, so the first one, a big one, uh, Charlie wants to know, why did you decide to become an author? So, Charlie, um, I, I, n- I have no short answers for this, um, and so I apologize in advance. Um, I uh, was a- and am still a reader, um, when, and when I was a kid, um, I just lived for books. I do think that there's a part uh, of any reader who, after you read books for a while, you think that you want to write one back. So there's that. But there is also, uh, when I went to college, um, I majored in English because then I could just read books all the time, which is what I wanted to do and still what I want to do. And uh, I had a professor who told me that I had a certain facility with words and that I should consider graduate school. And um, because I was so young, I thought that the professor was trying to tell me I was really super talented. Um, And I thought, (laughs) why should I bother with graduate school? I'll just go off and be a writer. So that was kind of when the idea firmly lodged in my brain. And then um, I spent a good 10 years um, wearing black turtlenecks and um, telling people, I'm a writer. I'm a writer and reading books on writing and dreaming about being a writer and not writing anything. So, uh, when I turned 30, I started to actually sit down and, and write. There you go. There's a long answer, Charlie. When did you (laughs) actually feel like you're a writer? It's a good question. As soon as I started to do it. Hmm. So it was, you didn't have to be published to feel like you could officially call yourself. No, I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to get published. I wanted to get published, but I felt like I, I, I just remember having that feeling of like, I would get up and do it before I went to work in the morning. And mm-hmm. I was just saying this to a friend the other day that like all day long, I would go and, and do the work and it didn't matter because the real work had already been done. And so that mm-hmm. must have been when I felt like I was a writer, when I finally started doing it and stopped talking about it, you know? Graham, I don't mean to co opt these questions, but I do have a follow-up again. When did you, when did you know that you wanted to write books for kids? Was that something you always wanted to do or did that uh, evol- evolve? No, later? Another really good question. So um, I, uh, when I started to write, I was working at a book warehouse um, here in Minneapolis, um, was book distributor. And uh, my job was picker. And I went around picking the books off the shelves and filling the orders. I was assigned to the third floor. That was all kids books on that third floor. And as a mm. reader, it was just a, 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 you know, a matter of time before I started to read some of those books that I was pulling off the shelf. And I read uh, The Watsons Go to Birmingham 1963 mm. by Christopher Paul Curtis. And I thought, gosh, this is so good. It's so funny. It's so warm. It's so loving. And it talks about something so huge. Um mm. And then I thought I wanted to try and do something like that. So Mm. that's uh, pretty soon after that, I started on Because of Win Dixie. Mm. Here's a question from Lily. Okay. Uh, She wants to know who your favorite authors were when you were growing up. Yeah, you know, it, it's it, it's uh, a really hard question to ask because I was the kind of kid who, to answer, because I was the kind of kid who, like, if it was a book, I loved it, you know? <laughs> I, I kind of read without discretion. Um, and also, I, I like to say this when I um, talk to kids about becoming a writer, that, like... And back when I was growing up, um, we never, I I never went to a book signing and met a writer. I never had a writer come into the classroom. I didn't Mm. think that human beings wrote books. I don't (laughs) know where I thought they came from, but all of which. Bookstore trolls. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. I, um, I just thought. You know, I, I just I, I there are books that I loved and that I returned to a lot. Um, mm. uh, William Penn Dubois. I never know how to say his name. The Twenty One Balloons. I remember reading and rereading that. Um, mm. The Mouse and the Motorcycle. Ralph oh, yeah. S. Mouse. Um, Stuart Little. But you know, so it wasn't. I wasn't going as much by um, you know who wrote it, but by uh, what it would, I, I love Paddington the Bear. I, I mm. love all of those original novels. 
Um, so I, I went by character and story more than by writer, I guess. Mm. And it seems like all of those that you just mentioned have animals as the main yeah. character. Yeah. And so we got a few questions uh, on that topic. So uh, Lucy and Kate have noticed that you use animals a lot in your books, and they want to know what your favorite animal is. Oh, my favorite animal is a dog. Um, yeah, uh, hands down. And and my dog, Ramona, for Ramona Quimby, is here right now, passed out on the floor at my feet, but she could <laughs> awaken at any moment. It's kind of like a sleeping lion. Um, and yeah, but I love all animals and, and thought for a long time when um, I was, you know, nine, 10 years old that I wanted to be a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. um, and boy, I couldn't have done that. So... Did you say what kind of dog Ramona is? She is a, a golden doodle, a, a miniature one. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Nora wants to know if you've ever had a pet pig. <laughs> Nora. No, Nora. You know, um, I, I, I have to say that uh, writing about Mercy Watson is one of the um, continuing great delights of my life. Um, but I've never been able to have a pig as a pet. And, and now that um, Ramona is here, I don't think Ramona would allow it. Yeah. Dogs and dogs and pigs famously get along well. So if you had a, let's say you had a neighbor who had a pet pig, would uh -huh. you, would you act more like a Eugenia or a, or a baby? Oh, I would be baby totally in that regard. That's I have to say, I understand Eugenia more than I wish I did. <laughs> you know, I understand how she likes rules and, and how she feels things should be. But like, totally, if, if my neighbors had a pig, I would be like over there all the time visiting the pig. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you just mentioned a couple of names from the books and we got a question about, about that, actually. Uh, Lily wants to know how you come up with the names you use in your books. Like... Chiro Skuro, for instance, was the one that she mentioned in particular. Um, you know, this is the weird thing with me with names and, and writing. Like everything about writing is hard for me. All of it, except for the names. And, mm. and I have learned to always <laughs> carry a notebook with me. Um, because I never know when a name is going to pop into my head. And a lot of times the name will lead to a story. And sometimes the name is something that I carry around for, uh, a long time before it. And then, and then when I'm working on a story, I, it's like, Oh, that's where it belongs. Like, um, Elf Ear, Nebraska, which shows up in Louisiana's way home. I had that in the back of the notebook for a long time. Um, Blundermeesen, which is where uh, uh, Dr. Meesham is uh, from uh, in Flora and Ulysses. I carried that name around for a long time. So I don't know where they come from. They just pop into my head. So you just said, though, that writing, everything about writing is difficult for you except the names. Yeah. So I imagine there's some kids out there that are listening that are saying, well, if it's so hard for her, why does she do it? So uh, why, why is that? You know, as a writer uh, who finds, yeah, I like fancy myself a writer sort of too. And I find it very difficult. And half the time I'm like, why am I doing this? Right. And you know, there's that great quote. I can't remember who said it. It might've been Fitzgerald that um, writing is, you know, the, the person that it's really, really hard for is, or is the writer. That's how you can tell if you're a writer or not. <laughs> um, and so why do it? Why do it? Um, it's a really good question because um, it, it, particularly when I talk about how I go through my days, because what I have learned, and I don't know if this is true for you, David, as somebody who writes, but I have, I've learned not to give myself any, chance to talk myself out of doing it. So um, because I am a coffee drinker, the coffee maker is set for five o'clock and it goes off automatically. And I hear it and I come downstairs and I do the writing before I can talk myself out of doing the writing. And so it, it's that Dorothy Parker quote about, I hate writing. I love having written. And then <laughs> It goes also back to that feeling that I talked about, like when I would go off to work every day and I felt like the real work had already been done. So mm. it's hard. It's difficult. 
And I can't think of anything more magical than holding a book in your hand that, um, that you've written or, or the most magical thing of all um, that somebody that you will never know and probably never meet like reads what you wrote and connects with you and um, you become mm. this community. I mean, because I always feel like the book is never done until it's uh, until somebody's mm. read it, you know, somebody that I don't know. And so mm. to be a part of that magical process, um, it, that's worth uh, how hard it is. And it is hard. And, and I don't believe anybody that says that it's not hard. Yeah. Here is a question from Stephanie, uh, and she would like to know if and how your writing process changes when you write books like Mercy Watson with lots of illustrations versus mm -hmm. longer chapter books with few or no illustrations. Yeah, that's a great question, Stephanie. Um, it, it, the process is still the same. Um, in that I, I work in small, short bursts. So when I started writing, um, I kind of like told myself that the deal was that I couldn't get up until I had written two pages uh, and then I could get up from the desk. And so that's still kind of the way I work. So when I'm doing something shorter that I know is going to have illustrations, I will still only do two pages a day. And then I do multiple drafts. Um, of it. So it's just a shorter work period. So if I'm writing something about Mercy Watson, um, then I, I get a draft within, you know, the first draft within four or five days of work. And then um, I put it aside and kind of like let it marinate, come back to it later, do a second draft, third draft. And in between, I'll, I'll work on another project, something longer, maybe. Um, and that's kind of yeah. So, but the process is still the same. Do you find it hard to bounce around between projects? So if you're working on a longer project, like just the headspace kind of concept? No, I don't. Well, I mean, I wouldn't be able to like work on Mercy Watson in the morning and then do work on the novel in the afternoon. I can't do that oh, kind yeah. of headspace thing, but like, I like being able to, uh, you know, because I always think, okay, I just need to get the first draft done and then I can put it aside. And so I'd like that break in between mm. and, yeah, uh, and then to, to turn to something else that maybe is in the third or fourth draft. So it's further along. And so that's kind of, again, how I jolly myself through it, you know? Mm. So we got a question about, about which of your favorite, of which of your books that you wrote is your favorite? This is from Anna. Anna. I can never answer that question, Anna. Um, because they really, the books seem like my kids and it's impossible to, pick one over the other. It's, I, I love them equally, but differently. I see them all as deeply flawed. Um, not that, you know, I'm saying anything about somebody's kids, but it's just like, <laughs> I love them and I cannot, I cannot pick a favorite. Yeah. Well, she all, Anna also wants to know, maybe this one's easier to answer. Maybe not. Uh, which of <laughs> your characters that you relate, which of your characters do you relate to the most? Hmm. Um, well, I can say that the closest I've ever come to kind of like putting myself in a book is um, in, in Rainy Nightingale with Rainy, because that's the kind mm. of kid that I was um, mm. shy and uh, hopeful and terrified and always kind of watching and listening. Um, and then there are other I, I mean, I relate to all of the characters because I think all the characters have some part of me in them. It's like, you know, who I want to be. Um, who, who I, um, think that I might be able to become and, and who I was, all of that is kind of mm. jammed in there into all those characters. Do you have a book that you, that was a hardest? And so you feel the most proud of having finished it. You said you couldn't sure. choose a favorite, but. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good way to think of it. So when I wrote Because of Winn-Dixie, I was working at that book warehouse, you know, and, um, I had a very, very realistic expectation for what would happen to a, a first time novel uh, for middle grade fiction. I just I, I could see clearly how publishing. I mean, it was just like I had I thought if I was really lucky, 5000 copies of Because of Winn-Dixie would sell. And um, 
And then I could, that would make me earn out my advance and then I would be able to do another one. So all of which is to say that what happened with Because of when dixie um, was just kind of overwhelmingly wonderful. Um, I mean, at this point, I don't know what the numbers are. I mean, the last time somebody told me it was 11 million copies of that book mm. have been sold. Um, and so what happens when you write a book that people love like that is you feel like you want to write another book like that so that people will keep on loving you. Right. And so, um, I, I got stuck as a writer thinking I have to write something else like because of when Dixie and, um, Mm. then I figured out if I was going to survive, I was going to have to, um, go in a totally different direction. And that was tale of Despero. Um, Mm. and so, and it was, so hard and scary to write it because I kept on thinking no one's gonna, you know, this is a totally different kind of book. Nobody's going to want to read it. And also it was so uh, complicated for me to write. It had, you know, I had to, had a gigantic timeline uh, taped over my desk so I could keep track of, and, and it was just really, really hard. And, um, and kind of like throwing myself into the abyss in a way, because I just didn't know if it was going to work out or if I was going to end. But um, yeah, so that one, that, that was the hardest one to write. Well, that's an amazing book. So. Oh, well, you're kind. You're kind. Uh, We have a couple of questions about Despero. The first one is what inspired you to write a modern fairy tale? That is the questioner's words. Yeah, so the 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 phrase um, "unlikely hero" was put into my head by my best friend's son, who was eight years old at the time. And when Dixie had uh, just been published, and he uh, his name is Luke, he had never been very impressed with me. And then, but he was a huge reader, and all of a sudden, <laughs> here I was with um, a book with my name on it. And so he he took me aside and told me that he had an idea for a book, which was the story of an unlikely hero with exceptionally large ears. And Luke didn't say it's a mouse, but to me that seemed like an obvious leap as an unlikely hero. And, um, and I was just so taken with the phrase. And so when I had this kind of, I have to go in a different direction, I had carried those words of Luke's around for a while. And I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to tell a fairy tale. I'm going to tell a fantasy. And, um, and I purposely, um, there were things in there that were, uh, what you call anachronisms, um, uh, like, uh, the King playing a song from, uh, 1950s the deep purple falls over sleepy garden walls. And I mean, so that goes to the whole modern fairy tale kind of, question, right? So I I realized that I was working on a fairy tale, but I deliberately let those other things come in too. So. Mm. And that question was from uh, Dara. I want to make sure to give her credit. Oh, Dara. Okay. (laughs) Uh, And uh, also Lucy wants to know, since soup is so important in the tale of Despero, what your favorite soup is? Um, I, I'm a fan of, um, something with a lot of noodles in it, given my Italian background. So if you put a lot of noodles in it, I love it. And also the other thing is if you make it for me, because again, (laughs) I'm not cooking it. (laughs) I I want it for spicy, right? Yeah. And spicy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We got a couple questions about some of your other books as well. I think we should just kind of go through these ones a little quickly because then Graham has a, um, Oh yeah. He's got a, he's got a little uh, quiz for you. A little, uh, I love a quiz. A little quiz. Uh, not a long one, just, just, you know, four questions. But before we get to that, Brock and Sarah want to know if or what, if any, particular life experience inspired the writing of The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. And they say it's a family favorite and has really had an impact on them. Oh, nice. Uh, that book started with uh, the literal gift of a rabbit doll. Um, and a friend gave the rabbit to me for Christmas. Um, he's, um, dressed in this very elegant outfit. He's kind of, he's made of melamine, which doesn't sound as good as China. And, uh, when I, she gave him to me, she said his name was Edward and, um, he's kind of a creepy looking rabbit. And I like, when I brought him home, I put him on the couch in the living room and I thought, eee, 
uh, you know, I, I feel like I might have nightmares with this thing in the house. And then I had a dream where the rabbit was underwater with um, no clothing on a naked rabbit dream, mainstay of all writers everywhere. <laughs> and, and I thought, what can I, it's like, it felt to me like it was a, a, definitely a book, but it was a picture book. And so I sat down with that image in mind and, um, and then something happened that doesn't happen very often, which is it just kind of told itself. It was mm. just like, I realized as it was happening that it was a gift. I remember walking around the lake here thinking, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it, and, and also having the ridiculous thought, okay, now I figured out how to write a novel, but I hadn't. It was just that that one like came mm. um, easier than any other book and was really a gift. Mm. These are, man, we just keep listening to all these titles. These are some good books. <laughs> <laughs> you say that to all your guests, yeah. You should write a bad one sometime just so we can, you know, just to balance it out. <laughs> There are a lot of them here. They're all <laughs> they're all in the closet. Yeah. Um, well, Jackie says that she reads the miraculous journey of Edward Tulane um, to her first graders every year. On the last couple of pages, the students are all cheering, and she is choking up every uh, year, seven years in a row. Uh, so that's uh, that's not a question. I just thought you might like to hear that. No, and I but I would like to thank her for um, that the miraculous gifts that she gives to those kids, not just of reading that book, but of reading um, books out loud to the it's second grade, right? Uh, first, I think grade. Was, yeah, first grade. First grade. Yeah. It's like, that is, I, I'm so grateful to teachers who do that. I, I just always think about myself in second grade um, with Mrs. Boyette reading Island of the Blue Dolphins. And, you know, and I grew up in a house filled with books. My mother read to me. She took me to the library. She bought me books. And I was living for Mrs. Boyette reading every day after lunch. So I think if it mattered that much to me, boy, it's got to matter to other kids too. So mm. thank you for reading out loud. Okay. Is it time for the really tough questions? Yep. I think it's time for the quiz. Yeah. Okay. So Kate. <laughs> yes. Graham. We have devised a quiz. Mm -hmm. Very serious. You should be feeling very anxious. <laughs> Um, well, that's like, it's a redundancy to say that I'm anxious. <laughs> I, I exist in a permanent state of anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. I would just <laughs> like to reiterate the seriousness of this quiz. Okay. <laughs> so in honor of, of the Beatri Beatrice Prophecy, your new book coming out, we developed a kind it's of... out already, but yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. That came out, uh, was it September? September. Yeah. Um, we've developed a... Beatrice themed quiz. Now we are not going to quiz you on your own book, but we've gathered some kind of notable Beatrices that we have some questions about. Oh, wow. This is <laughs> going to be hard. Okay. It, no, it's very serious. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Question number one Beatrice in Dante's Divine Comedy. I knew that would be the first one. Yes. <laughs> guides the pilgrim along his journey. Uh huh. And acts as a link between the physical and the divine. Mm. Which of these do you think best represents a link between the physical and divine? A hammock with a good book and a nice breeze. Mm. Flipping your pillow over to the cool side on a hot night. Or hearing your mom say, let's say when you're a middle schooler, honey, it snowed last night. School is canceled. Go back to bed. <laughs> Oh, there's no contest. It's A. Yeah. It's the book in the hammock? The book in the hammock and the breeze. Yeah. Yeah. It's the best. It yeah. really is the best. Okay. You got that one. You got that. Yeah. Congratulations. You know what, you're one for one. <laughs> the, the thing that I like to do, if I'm ever like super comfortable in reading, well, I don't like to do this, but I'm often reading and then I drop the book on myself because I've fallen asleep. If I'm oh, in yeah, some kind of hammock dangerous. situation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Question number two. In Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, mm. the sharp-witted and feisty Beatrice delivers some of the most memorable lines in the play. Mm. Which of these is the sickest burn? As the as kids the, say. As the kids. Well, they probably don't even say it anymore. That's true. That's the, true. Some, kids. some kids said once. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. I had rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. Mm. Okay, this one. The messenger comes up. I can see he's not in your good books, he says. No, and if he were, I would burn my library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Number three, scratching could not make it worse as twere such a face as was yours. I'm going with number one. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, just because I wish that I had written it. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, you're two for two. <laughs> I think we all wish we had written Shakespeare. <laughs> you're right. I was going to say, not that that's a novel, ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Wish, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, Princess. Talk about a guy who makes it look easy. <laughs> Question number three. Uh huh. Princess Beatrice is the current Princess of York. She oh, lives wow. in a palace. Uh huh. And mm-hmm. is tenth in line of succession for the British throne. Mm. Here's the question: Okay, is that life of royalty and luxury worth it if you still have to wear those silly hats in public? <laughs> you want me to answer? <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah. absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like it's like it's a no-brainer. Of course it isn't. You know, no. Absolutely. You want go back to go back to the first question. You want a hammock and a book. Yeah, that's yeah. what you want in this world. Yeah, or I do. Yeah. They're three for three. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, All right. So, but, 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 but this is a tough one. The last one, I uh, I cheated a little bit, but not really. I went back to the Latin. So Beatrice comes from Beatrix. So now we're going to talk about Beatrix Potter. Mm. Okay. Beatrix Potter, the author and illustrator of children's classics, Beloved the World Over. Okay. While Peter Rabbit, Benjamin Bunny, Jemima Puddle Duck, and her other wonderful characters lived a, lived a vibrantly colorful life, according to my photographic research, Beatrix herself was black and white. What accounts for this curious contrast? Go. <laughs> I don't, you know, I have to tell you, I have held in my hands the original, I think it was Peter Rabbit um, illustrations um, with that have no light color in them at all, not even his little, uh, his little jacket. So I, I don't know who added the coloration later on. I'm not. Um, mm learned it enough to to answer that but i know that it was just uh pen and ink uh was what she was uh yeah so but maybe maybe the next time i come back we can talk about that that would be <laughs> wonderful all right excellent job okay i'm gonna, so I'm gonna submit four this four. i'm gonna yeah, submit this to the uh the higher ups uh for assessment and Oh, good. And that then, report card then, out. Yeah, give me the results in triplicate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's probably going to take eight to 12 weeks. <laughs> All right. Well, we're at the time of the episode where it is time for our word of the week. And Graham, it's season three, which means it's time for some changes because listen, I appreciate, you know, we're good friends and I, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I it's appreciate fine. all of your efforts to, to, to get that, that word of the week printer to work last season. But just between you and me and Kate and everybody who's listening, I, I don't think we can continue with the word of the week printer. It was it, just too much trouble. It's been it's, a struggle. It's been honestly, a struggle. Honestly, it's probably your greatest flaw is your inability to use the word of the week printer. And I so think let's try ever, something new. Well, I think ever since we gave it uh, first off legs, but then... Yeah, uh, that, that was maybe a mistake. Consciousness... I think it's only fair that we kind of release it into the wild. That's true. We should set it free. Set it free. Okay. It's not a metaphor. Okay. All right. (laughs) It's not a metaphor, Kate. It's not a metaphor. Um, (laughs) So so what I did during between the the break, the reason we needed a break between seasons two and three is I needed some time to compile the official word of the week, Withy Wendell word of the week dictionary. Oh, so we don't have to be... (laughs) O-W-D. So we don't have to be reliant on this printer anymore. No, no. So um, I'm going to go get the dictionary and I'm going to go, you know, we're going we're gonna to open it at random and we're going, to, we're going to choose this week's word of the week through the word of the week dictionary. So I'll be right back. Graham, we have a problem. Oh no, what is it? The bookstore troll has struck again. The dictionary is gone, and in its place is a note. 
You better read this note. Oh, you want to? Okay. The note says, I have your dictionary. Oh, so now, okay. So we have to, we're going well, we to, know where to go he is. Into, He's in his cave. He's, we got to go into the lair. Wait, we, now go into the lair. we have to decide but, which one of us. No, 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 no. That's the detail on the note. Okay. Fine print, really small. Send Graham. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. All right. So go, right. I guess go, I'll be back. Go find out. Okay. Okay. All right. I've got the word. He gave me the word, but he did not give me the dictionary back. He says each week he will give us one word in exchange for something. Basically, he's holding the dictionary ransom. So he's being magnanimous here in episode 3.1? I, I suppose. But in the so future, here, he's going to be less magnanimous? Okay. All so right. here's the word. We'll just deal with the next weeks as they come. <laughs> now, do you have a word? Yeah, I do. I do have the word. Okay. I thought you were... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, okay. This is an interesting one. Okay. So, okay. Here's our word of the week. You, are you ready to ready to write it down? Everybody who's listening, get ready to write it down. It's Nainsook. N-A-I-N-S-O-O-K. Nainsook. What? Yeah. Nainsook. Spell that again. N-A-I-N-S-O-O-K. And we're back. Graham, as is tradition, you're up first. Nainsook. What does it mean? Nainsook is the name of both a fruit and a dish made from the fruit. Now, th this dish is a specific soup that comes from the Oceanian Islands. And it's made from the Nainsook fruit, which is vibrant purple color. But they only offer you this soup if you're able to get one of the fruits from the Nainsook tree. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And 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 we'd have to put put some some crushed red pepper and some noodles to get Kate to eat it. That's right. Uh, um well I think you're wrong. I think the Nain Sook is that wheel that is on the spinning loom, the last used when spinning gold and the rumple stilts can tail. Mm. So it's that it's the specific thing, the wheel that's on the loom. That's really nice. So, um, I, I don't believe either one of you. I think I'm right. <laughs> um, and you know how um, when somebody uh, has given up on you or cast you out, you've been forsook, forsaken, mm. you know? Um, so Nainsook is when you give up your family name and set out in search of your own name, Nainsook. I don't know if that's the real definition, but it definitely should be. Should we just end? We, I guess it'd be confusing if we just appropriate that definition into the into the right. World. Okay, I can't uh, wait to hear what it means. Okay, so Nainsook is, and I'm going to uncover this now. <laughs> this is classic. Nainsook is a fine cotton fabric. Wow, that's it. So, yeah, so it's that's a kind it? of fine cotton. Fabric. Nobody's traveling anywhere and becoming them real their real selves. No one's eating soup and no one's spinning anything. I mean, it, yours <laughs> is the closest, David, because I, it has I guess to so, do yeah. with, with with cloth of uh, and, and, you know, at some point. Yeah. All right. So one one word that I had um found here, I looked up the definition. The word was I'm this is just a bonus word. It's called meldrop. And it's, I didn't choose it because the definition is a drop of mucus at the nose, whether produced by cold or otherwise. <laughs> wow. How do you spell that? M-E-L-D-R-O-P. -E M-E-L-D-R-O-P. Meldrop. It would be a great name for a pharmacy. <laughs> That's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Okay. Well, Kate, we have loved chatting with you. Thank you so much for coming on. Last question here is, do you have any advice for the kids who are listening who want to be writers or illustrators? I do. I, I have advice for the kids who are listening who want to be uh, writers or illustrators and the adults who are listening who want to be writers or illustrators. <laughs> it's all the same, you know, it, it, whether you're eight or 68. Um, it's read as much as you can. Uh, find a way to do the work of making something every day if you can. Make a deal with yourself about doing that work. Carry a notebook with you uh, and eavesdrop as much as you can. Um, the notebook to me is always a reminder that it, it's my job in the world to pay attention to everything and to keep everything open, my eyes and my ears and my brain yeah. and my heart 
Um, and then um, don't let anybody talk you into becoming a lawyer. Because <laughs> if you have a, a verbal facility, that's what they usually um, yeah. say. Hey, you could be a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. You know the author Wendell Berry by any chance? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Did you read the great uh, profile of him in the New York? I did. Yeah. So, yeah. so I've gotten to know him a little bit. But Graham and I both have. And he told me once that his dad and his brother were lawyers, and everybody thought he should be a lawyer because he had a facility with words. But then he said he gets too nervous when he has to stand up, so he likes just writing it because he can revise it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, well, you tell Wendell Berry that I said hey and that I'm a fan. Oh, yeah. well, I don't know if I know him. I don't, we've gotten to know him. I didn't say that. I'm like, I might like, are, you can no, write him a letter. I said, just, hey. Okay. All right. I will. I will. <laughs> well, speaking of other writers, before we go, we like to ask our guests to challenge one other writer to come on this podcast to endure the slings and arrows that is the Withy Wendell podcast. Who would you like to, to challenge to come on? M.T. Anderson. M.T. You know, Anderson. Yeah. Do you know Tobin? Um, he's written uh, Feed and uh oh, yeah. landscape with the bills but yeah okay yeah. you you'll uh, love having it's a great one yeah. well mt anderson consider yourself challenged katie camillo thank you for coming on and thank you for bearing the slings and arrows yourself here on with you window oh it was so much fun thank you goodbye bookstore troll okay well that was our conversation with kd camillo that was um, a 13 out of one score on on that conversation it was a great time excellent and that brings us to riddle time Ooh. but graham Yes. You, you tend to put our authors through just a terrible experience of having to answer questions in a quiz. Uh, 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 nobody else has ever um, categorized. <laughs> it is terrible. It is terrible. I think I've heard amazing. Wow. Wow <laughs> comes up a lot. Like those, yeah. those questions I've yeah. heard. Challenging, um, but in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't appreciate okay, that. Okay, you know what? You put them through a challenging but in a good way experience of having to have to answer questions in a quiz. But you know what? Mm-hmm. You have expressed your expertise in penny farthings on this episode. Yeah. And that I, I I'd say I'm the I, foremost expert in North America. Okay. You are claiming to be the foremost expert in North America on the penny farthing. Yeah, because I own one. Well, I am now going Apparently. to put you through a penny farthing quiz before we get to our riddle. So we're, okay. we're going to find out just how smart you are about penny farthings. Uh-huh. uh-huh okay. Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Maybe not the foremost expert, but... Um, uh, you are an I'm, expert I'm, on a scale of expertise. I'm, an, I'm uh, somewhat knowledgeable about these things. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> okay. 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 The name penny farthing uh-huh. comes from... Oh, this is easy. Go ahead. Like I said earlier, the wheels are made out of brass. Okay. What are pennies made out of? Probably coppers. I, <laughs> yeah. Br- I mean, brass. They're made out of brass, too. They're, they're made out of metal, at least. So, um, the, 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 so that when people see them driving, do you drive? I know this. You ride it. Yeah. Um, yeah. As, ride as, as they see them yeah. riding down uh-huh. the street. Uh-huh. Really, they th- they think those large wheels look like uh, giant pennies. Oh. That's why they're called the penny farthing. So it comes from the British name penny mm-hmm. and farthing. Those are two different coins, the yeah. penny and the farthing. Yeah, coins. I said coins. One of which is much larger than the latter. I said coins. Yeah, you did. You I said did coins. say coins. Right, because right, it's right there in the name. It's like I a lazy word. I said it, and you heard it. I did. Okay. I'd now, say that's one for one. Eugene Meyer. Oh, <laughs> you, you, oh yeah Eugene Meyer was oh, yeah. the inventor of the high wheeler bicycle design in 1869 and he fashioned the wire spoke tension wheel yeah god you bless just, him yeah, I, I, don't, I don't even know I, mean that. I know you're an expert on the wire spoke tension wheel now I, I've written many you, a paper out of these options <laughs> Eugene Meyer was from which country oh well, out of these options oh I don't even need them but go ahead Narnia uh huh North Carolina the country of North Carolina I said what I said. Before it was a state. It was Narnia. A country, I remember now. North Carolina. France. What? You need more? Uh, keep going. <laughs> oh, I'm just waiting for Spain? you to say the right one. Uh, keep going. <laughs> Germany. The Czech Republic. <laughs> I think it was France. Hungary. I think it's France. Slovenia. Estonia. Tunis- oh, 
Yes, it was France. Sorry, I got. I was like in a little zone there. I was just saying countries. I knew it was France. I yeah. just was like Eugene Meyer was a Frenchman. That's yeah. right. That's you right. can tell by his name, Eugene Meyer, somehow. Okay, now which country continues to have a race called the Sweden Three Days High Wheel Highway, Race? Hi, hi, this, yeah. Which I'm, country has? The Sweden, Sweden three, three Days, days High Wheel high Race. High Wheel Race. Yep. I yes. know that one. Which country? Yeah. yeah name, okay. name out, a of, out of the options, here uh-huh. are your, your options. Narnia. <laughs> uh-huh. North Carolina. Well, Narnia might. I don't know. France. Mm-hmm. Estonia. It's France. If, if France was called Estonia. It has the Sweden Three <laughs> <laughs> I know it's called the Swedish three-day high, highland <laughs> tossing. So it's, it's, it's in Europe. They have it in Europe. The country of Europe. That's they right. They have it in Europe. It actually happens in Istad, a yep, Istad. town and the seat of Istad municipality in yep. Scania County, Sweden. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also known as France. <laughs> also, well, we never said this was a podcast where you'd learn accurate facts about geography uh, or about penny farthings. <laughs> David, I have a confession. What? <laughs> I'm not the foremost expert, and I I, I might have invented um, the fact that I own this uh, high wheeled bicycle. Did you know that there is a particular model made by Pope Manufacturing Company, 1886, that weighed 36 pounds, had a 60 spoke, 53 inch front wheel, and a 20 spoke, 18 inch rear wheel, fitted with solid rubber tires? Not copper. No, that uh, that's new thing. That's like, because uh, they kept riding over the road, like riding over elephants and stuff. And oh, wait, popping it, what's so. the model called? The, it was, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, it didn't say it's called the Pope manufacturing model of 1886 wearing 36 pounds. Oh, I model. think that's the one I have. Yeah, you, that, oh, you have the 1886 yeah, model. Even though I said I didn't own one. It, now it, I'm saying it I do is a good, it's a nostalgia model. It's a really, it's a big nostalgia model. Big yeah. Nostalgia model. Speaking of nostalgia, the kids want their riddles. Oh, right. So would you like to explain to the kids how this segment works? Oh, so riddle time. Riddle time. So each week, either myself or David will present a riddle. Like me? I I will not present you as a riddle, but you could present the riddle. Oh, I see. And then kids can email us at podcasts at goldberrybooks.com with their answer. The end of the season, uh, we will pick one winner from the entire season. So you can, multiple, you can enter multiple. You can you can enter every single answer week. Ten riddles correctly, or nine, or however many. You get you, ten entries. You get, yeah. Okay, then at the end, you get ten times the chance of winning. Yes, and you will win a book bundle, and uh, probably we'll have some books from some of the guests we are going to have on. We will, including possibly maybe a couple of signed ones from some people that we've already talked to. I hope to, so, so. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for the the three point one? Th- uh, Withy Windle Riddle? Threeth point one. Threeth point one th- Withy Windle. It's a tough one. Third season, first episode, Riddle, go. Okay. So, there's a man. His name is Larry. Norton. L- no, his name is Larry, Graham. Larry Norton. Oh, well, his name's Larry Norton. I see what you're saying. Yes. I didn't actually know his last name, but it does make sense. He does look like a Norton. He looks like people from the Norton clan. So, he is... Um, heading to town. Mm-hmm. He's a farmer, and he's heading to town on a penny farthing. Well, no, I think that in what he's doing here would be very difficult to do on a penny farthing. He left his penny farthing at home because he needed to replace that the rubber wheel because the brass ones hadn't been invented yet. It's a long story. So he heads to town. He has three things with him. Okay. He has a sack of corn. Yes. Because he is a uh, corn farmer, so he's taking yeah. the sack of corn into town to sell. He also has a goose. <laughs> Because he has a flock of geese. Then he also has a fox. I don't actually know why he has a fox. The other ones I had explanations for. Don't know why he has a fox. The fox is just following. Right. Well, Nate, perhaps. Yeah, maybe he's like a. The fox is friendly. Anyway, he comes to a stream because every time a farmer goes to town, there's a stream in the way. It's just like part of the rules. It's part of the farming rules. Right, yep. So he, he has to cross the stream. In a tiny boat. But here's the thing. The boat is so tiny Mm -hmm. and can only handle so much weight. So he can only take one of these three things across at a time. 
he can't leave the fox alone with the goose because, well, I know what would happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah we all. But know. he also can't leave the goose alone with the corn. So, how does he get them all safely over the stream? That's this week's riddle. I feel like this is a classic riddle. I can't tell if that's a good thing. <laughs> no, it's a great thing. This is this is a this is one that's been around a long time. So the farmer Larry Norton, he comes Junior. to the stream. <laughs> he comes to the stream. No, again, Larry Norton Jr. is back washing over the penny farthing. Oh, oh, oh! In case his Brad dad comes to steal it. it again. This is Larry Norman Senior. <laughs> Not Norman Norton. Norton. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. So, so he comes to the stream. He's got a fox, a goose, and a sack of corn. He, the boat can only handle so much weight, so he can only take them over one at a time. But how does he get them all over so he can get to town and take care of his farmer business? That's, that's the riddle. It's great. So if you think you know the answer to David's classic Larry Riddle, <laughs> email us at podcasts at goldberrybooks.com and you will be entered to win. Of course, you can also do that, not just with the answer to the riddle, but with what you think a roller coaster ought to actually be called. Yeah. Make, fix that lazy word, why fix don't you? Fix that lazy word. Well, this has been the first episode, the first episode the one. of the one episode of season three. Here I feel Winnie like Riddle. it was, it was just excellent. It was, <laughs> is excellent a lazy word? No, that's a good word. No, that's a great word. Thank you so much to Kate DiCamillo for spending some time with us, for bearing the slings and arrows of the outrageous quiz that you gave her, for giving us great advice and for telling us some great stories. Graham, thank you for bringing a lazy word to this podcast. Bringing all kinds of laziness to this podcast. Hey. <laughs> mm. And don't forget, for next week, we are starting Phantom Tollbooth, chapters one and two. And if you want to look forward to next week's guest, check out Tim Probert's book, Lightfall, if you haven't done that yet. If you have gotten it, make sure you prepare yourself. Prepare yourself, Graham, yeah. to read that second Lightfall book because it's going to be great. Steal yourself. Steal yourself, exactly. And in the meantime, steal yourself for a whole week of having to wait for another episode of Withy Window.